Good morning, everyone. My name is Gar <coughs> My name is. How are we doing back there? My name is Daryl McCannell. Uh, those of you that don't know me, somebody already referred to me as uh, Pastor Daryl. <laughs> no, we're not going to go there. Don't don't even think about that. But we pray for Pastor Daryl, the other Pastor Daryl, for sure. Uh, I'm Corey's father, in case you don't know what the connection is. And I just want to take a moment. Uh, Jane, my wife, is in Minnesota. She's been in Minnesota for about three and a half weeks or a little bit more, maybe. She went down there on her own initiative. Uh, she's not stuck down there in Minnesota. The place that she is at in near Bemidji, it's quite... Uh, it's a healthy region. There's not a whole lot of COVID or anything in northern Minnesota. And she's really enjoying it. We have uh, seven grandchildren there. We have two kids there. They have one in Bemidji and then one lives with us in our place uh, near Bemidji. So Jane is having a lot of fun with the grandkids. She kayaks every day. She paddle boards every day. We talk. She's having a great time. She has a women's prayer group down there. Uh, the praying ladies. I told her this morning her praying ladies, when she said they were praying for me and praying for what's going to happen this morning, I said, that sounds like an insect. Uh, you know, <laughs> praying mantis, praying ladies, you know. But <laughs> I'm sure they'll be much more effective than an insect. Um, but Jane and I just want to thank the church here, the members of the church, the people here who have made us really welcome to Killarney. We retired to Killarney from Brandon a couple of years ago now, almost three years, I guess. And I just want to thank you all here at the church for welcoming us into this church and into this community. Uh, we really appreciate your friendship already and getting to know more and more of you all the time. So we appreciate that. Um, just in case I... You might think I'm winking at you this morning for some reason or I'll look over the top of my glasses every now and then. Don't let that alarm you. I'm not winking at you. I do have an eye condition right now I'm kind of dealing with. Normally I would wear a patch because uh, by closing this right eye, then I see you as individuals. If I open up this eye, I, I have double vision. So that means if I open both eyes, there's twice as many people here, which is kind of neat too, you know. But if I do close my eye, just I'm just focusing a little bit more in on different things that I need to focus in on. Closer up, though, my vision is okay. So I can normally have two eyes open and I can watch my, uh, my uh, PowerPoint here this morning. I taught at Brand University for 30 years. Uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Dick was one of my students, and he said this morning, Daryl, I hope your message this morning isn't like one of your university lectures. I'll be out like a light in about two minutes. Um, so hopefully not. If you see him nodding off over there, there's a good reason because he's heard me uh, teach uh, courses at Brandon University uh, numerous times. So, um, so that's just a little heads up on that. Um, and again, we're very, very thankful. When Brian asked me, could you share with the people on August 16th? I said, oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll pray about it. You know, that's what you do when you're asked. You know, you, and I did. I seriously prayed about coming here and, and talking to you. And not really a message. It's really sharing is what I would prefer. And uh, a few days later, he called me and he said, so, Daryl, have you made up your mind? Have you, would you cover for the 16th? I'm going to be gone. I said, well, I've prayed about it. I, the Lord really hasn't given me any. I mean, the writing, he hasn't put any writing on the wall. I just, I need writing on the wall, it seems, for me to, you know, to do this. And typically, Brian Corr's response was, well, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> and I, that kind of caught me off guard a little bit. And we chuckled about that. I'm in the wrong room. No one you can't see any writing on the wall. But, and I thought, well, if I do change rooms, um, maybe the writing wouldn't be on that wall either. But it got me thinking, what room am I in? Matter of fact, what house am I in? And the Lord really prompted me and he said, Daryl, are you dwelling in my house? 
Think about that for a minute. Are you in my house? And once I started thinking about that, I said to Brian, yes, I will do it. I will share with the people what the Lord is doing in my life currently. So that's kind of how that happened. So my message this morning, I entitled it, The Prospector. Thanks, Jeannie, for reading Job 28, 1 through 11. And we'll get to that as we move along here. But before I get started, I want to give you a warning. I want to warn you about a couple of things here this morning. Number one, this message has the potential to make significant changes in your life. Now, I'm not saying that just because I'm here with you this morning, and I'm saying that because it, this is how it affected my life. This started about three weeks ago, what I'm going to share with you this morning. And so don't be surprised as I share. There might be some changes take, part, take place in your life over the next little while. You may have a great desire to make these changes. Got to watch out for that. You might be surprised. You might have a desire to make changes. Now, wouldn't that be something? Once changes begin, you might not be able to stop them. You know, it says that if we taste the Lord and his kindness... We get a taste of his kindness. What do you think might happen next? We might take a whole mouthful next. We might even overindulge in the things of the Lord. I mean, we've got to be careful here. Watch out for a little taste of the Lord. You may even delight in making such changes. Wouldn't that be exciting? You might even delight in it. It, ma it may cause you to, on occasion, be completely overwhelmed by his grace, by his love, by his mercy. Completely overwhelmed. Mark 7.37 says that the people were overwhelmed in amazement as to all the wonderful things that the Lord was doing. Just think of that for a minute. We're so overwhelmed with everything else in the world right now. We're over overwhelmed with COVID. We're overwhelmed with economy and what's going to happen there and what's going to happen in school and what's going to happen here and what's going to happen to our life. And we're, gonna, what's it, what, we're overwhelmed with the world right now and what's happening. What chaos and what mess politically and everything else. This story, that story, this news, that news. We are overwhelmed with that. We don't really realize it. We do our best to push through it, put on a smiley face. Well, it's going to be okay. But we're tense and we're aggressive. And we go home and we get aggressive and we say things and do things. We're overwhelmed. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we're overwhelmed like those people in Mark 737? Overwhelmed in amazement as to the wonderful things that God is doing. Those are the things we need to focus on. That's what the Lord has been showing me in the last little while. And, hey, most of all, the man's prayer, Red Green's man's prayer is going to have to be modified. You remember the man's prayer. Al remembers it. I know he does. You all remember it. Red Green, the man's prayer, it's going to have to be modified. Well, there, everybody, how's it going? Man, I want you to bow for a minute and repeat after me the man's prayer. Men, are you ready? I am a man, but I can change if I have to, I guess. I thought Harold was staying at home. I don't know what he's doing here. He may need a change. Oh, no. Speaking of change, though, Harold, you better go home and uh, change and take a, take a shower. I think that might be the way to go. Anyway, the man's prayer 
is going to have to change. Probably. That's a warning. Uh, another thing, if, if you take in this message, it's not just the message. It's the, the, the Lord of all that is behind the message. It's going to do the changing. We know that. Um, it's going to have to be modified a little bit. You may not have to change. You may want to change. And there won't be any guessing about it. There won't be any guessing about it because the Lord is going to make it very clear to you the more we press into him. <coughs> Where's my little clicker? There it is. Now, I include words in here like you'll see up there, uh, potential to make change. It's a warning that, that it, these things could happen in your life. They may happen in your life. There's potential for them to happen in your life. And I, and I use them intentionally, as I say at the bottom. That's the caveat. That a, as personal discretion is expected and accepted as a normal response. So all of you are going to respond a little bit differently from this message this morning. And that's what I do when I hear messages. I doodle and I take notes and somebody else does someone, something else. And we walk away with a little different tidbits, little different nuggets of what this uh, message has meant to us personally. And I use those intentionally. It's kind of like uh, a mo going to a movie. And I say to L, I meet L on the street and I say, L, you got to see this movie. Man, was it ever good. Boy, if you get a chance, watch that movie. Well, a couple days later, I meet L on the street and I say, L, L, did you watch that movie? Did you go to that movie? What'd you think? And L goes, uh, yeah, 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 we, uh, we went to the movie. Oh, what did what, what, you think? What did you think? Well, well, it, it, was, um, it was different. And, and, well, we, yeah, we sort of enjoyed it. Yeah, Daryl, thanks for, thanks for telling us about it. See you later. So it's like that. Everybody has a little different uh, sense of what, is gonna, what this message is going to you, mean to you today. We all have a degree of the prospector in our life, don't we? We're always seeking and searching for something. We're all always longing for something. It says in Lamentations 3.11 that God has planted, he has put in us eternity. So there's something inside of all of us that is searching and looking for more, looking for a purpose, looking for meaning. There is something inside of us, okay? We're made in God's image, made in his image so that I thought of an analogy this morning, and I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but it's like twins who were separated when they were younger. And uh, they've all, as they grew up, they sensed that there was the part of them that's missing. They sensed that there was something else out there that they were connected to, but they didn't quite know what it was. And in our case, the, the twin is the larger twin, of course, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit when it intermingles with our spirit, then, um, you know, that longing is fulfilled, all right? But we all have a longing. We go to grad sales, we go to flea markets, somebody else's junk is our treasure, and we, if there's an old building across the road, we, oh, I'd like to go through that old building. There might be an old, who knows what I'll find in there, you know? We, we want to get a uh, metal detector. We want to search. We want to look. We want to, have you ever snooped into your sister's diary, you know? Are you on Facebook and you're going down, oh, you're searching and you're looking for story, this story, that story, and everything else. So that's built into us. Facebook. Have you ever heard of data mining? People, are, people dig into things. Sometimes people dig into things they shouldn't dig into. But that's kind of what we do. We go, to, we go to Mars, you know? We go to the moon. We build things. As Jeannie read in chapter 28 of Job, we dig. We create channels. We tunnel. The point is, we're all prospectors. But the question is, what are we prospecting for? All right, so that's a little bit of an intro. And I'm all, almost up. My time is up. I've got a whole message to go here. So let's pray before I really dive in, before we really dig in here. And I'm going to pray Psalm 3, 3 through 4 for you this morning, for us this morning, okay? And I would say, 
let's, as a gesture, and it's up to you, but as a gesture, let's, let's open our hands this morning as I pray. Um, pray Psalm 3. You know, we're, I've, been, I've been like this myself occasionally over the last few weeks. You find out your fists are clenched or your arms are tense or your shoulders tight from all the worldly things that are happening right now. And we, we cannot relax. We just, we just can't. And our head is bowed and we're going around and what's COVID going to do next? Who's going to be the next sick, sick person? What's going to happen? No, no. Let's, as a gesture, I don't care, you can raise your hands or you can keep them on your lap. But let's, uh, let's open ourselves, our hands and our hearts to what the Lord has this morning. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, According to Psalm 3, 3 and 4, you are the glory and the lifter of our head. Lift our heads this morning, Lord Jesus. Take the tension away from our hearts and our minds. You are the lifter of our head. Lord, you hear our cry from your holy hill, from your mountain. You hear our voice and you will answer. And you also say there that you are our shield. So, Lord, shield us and lift our heads today for your glory. And we pray this in your name. Amen. A little bit of background. I was raised and born, born and raised. I wasn't raised and then born. I was born and raised in southwest Manitoba. I'm a farm boy from out in that corner of the province. And um, I, when I was younger, I like to talk to God. I would climb up in a tree on the farm and 10 years, 12 years old, and I would talk to God. I was a good kid and I know oh, God had to exist. I'm sure he exists. And I would say thing, things like this. I would say, how are you today, God? And then I'd say, uh, oh God, I know you're busy. Uh, you go on and take care of those people that really need you. And I, I'm good. Hey, I'm good. Don't worry about me. There are people with problems. Hey, go and talk to them. Go and help them. Go and heal them. Go touch them. They need you. Hey, I'm good. Don't worry about me. And I remember having all those kinds of conversations with them. Not often, but occasionally. So I, felt, I wanted to feel comfortable with God. I didn't know any better. We went to a mainline church, and then it closed, and then we stopped going, and that was, that was it for going to church. So I grew up there on the farm in Alva, Manitoba. In July 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts landed on the moon, and a month later, I landed on the campus at Bemidji State University in Minnesota. Bemidji State University in Minnesota. I was an alien there. I really was. It was a different planet. I was a naive, good kid from the farm in Alva, Manitoba. Farm kid. Didn't know any better. I didn't know how big the sports were in the States in 1969. And it still is to this day. Sports, athletics. Boy, you go to the... They're, they're big time. It's big time. Their football's big time. Everything's big time. I thought I could go out for every team when I get down there. I wasn't recruited. I didn't know you had to be recruited. I didn't know there were scholarships available for athletes. I just wanted to go down there. and Well, my plan was to go to university, play hockey... Uh, maybe a little baseball and get a degree. Well, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. Here's the better way. Go to university, get a degree, play hockey and maybe a little baseball. That was my plan. I wasn't recruited. I was just a farm kid. I was a good farm kid. Little did I know, God's plan, here's God's plan for me. I didn't know this at the time. Go to university, get saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, find a beautiful Christian girl to marry, end up having a wonderful family, develop a faith-filled friendship that would last forever. All these friends that we got from the university and through uh, our Christian fellowships. And oh yes, get a degree, play hockey, and maybe a little baseball. Not just a farm kid, but a farm kid saved by grace. Didn't know that was going to happen. God's salvation. I was a good kid. There was a hockey player. 
on the team from Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. His name was Austin Bennett. He was also trying out for the team. We were trying out together. We met at lunch one day. I found out he was from Saskatchewan. I was from Manitoba. A little friendship developed. We went through all the dry land training, getting ready to get onto the ice, try out, see how we would do, and he was a very good defenseman. He, uh, very good hockey player, but he also went to church. How could you be a hockey player and go to church? That did not make sense to me. He didn't party, he didn't cuss, he didn't swear. He took you out in the corners when we played hockey, when we practiced in various games. He was tough, tough player, good skater. And I couldn't, he doesn't go to church, does he? Why would he ever go to, hockey players don't go to church generally. Well, one day he asked me, do you want to go to church? And I thought, um, no, I have to study. Well, I never studied through high school. But that was a pretty good excuse. Don't have to go to church, I'm going to study. Well, so I fended him off for a week or two. And, but his behavior, his character, I just couldn't get over how he could play hockey like that and then go to church. What is it with this guy? What is it with Austin? Well, I finally did go to church. I walk in to the Covenant Church in Bemidji, Minnesota, and there were young people, college-age kids, carrying a Bible. I had never seen anything like that in my life. The church I went to as a kid, the only person that carried a Bible was the reverend, was the minister, He's the one that should be carrying the Bible. Not us. No, no, the pastor, the minister, he's the Bible guy. And I walk into this church and all these kids, well, I call them kids, but all these young college students carried the Bible and it looked like they were reading it during the service. Can you imagine that? I felt a little uncomfortable. Music was okay. The pastor... Pretty good message. I didn't really hear any of it because I was, I don't know if I want to stay. I maybe want to go. This might be a little intimidating for me. But afterwards, yeah, and afterwards I decided, no, I'm not going to come back. He invited me a few times. No, no, no. Well, one day he invited me to Sunday school. Well, that's not church. It's Sunday school. Maybe that's not quite so intimidating. But where was my head? Sunday school, Sunday what? School. If I had a thought about that for a minute, I wouldn't have gone. Oh, Sunday school, piece of cake, yeah. Well, Sunday school, you cannot hide in the back pew like I did at the Covenant Church. Sunday school, college kids Sunday school, at the youth center, they were sitting around only 12 of them. You can't hide in 12, with 12 people. They were sitting around in a horseshoe fashion. The leader was at the front, the fireplace, everything else, very cozy, very comfortable. But then they prayed, and then they started talking about Jesus Christ. What? You know Jesus personally? And I'm sitting there going, how can these people talk like that? I remember maybe memorizing one beatitude or... Our Father who art in heaven. I was trying to think of what scripture that I might know, but it was pretty limited. And they were reading from the scripture and God did this and God did that and Jesus was a big part. What? A big part of your life? Yeah, he answered this prayer and he answered that. that. So in my mind, I was thinking of all these things about them. How could they talk like that? And near the end, it was coming down to me. They were sharing and it was coming around. And I'm sitting there looking for the back door. I wanted to get out of there fast. Because what, what was I going to say? I didn't, I didn't have anything to say. And I was getting mad. I was upset. Stewing in my chair. It came down. Austin said something. I don't know what it was. And then the leader said, well, that's it for today. Let me pray and we'll see you all at church. So they bowed and prayed. And while they were bowing and praying, 
I was so angry that they could talk like this about Jesus on a personal level. Isn't that something private? Isn't your relationship with God a private thing? That's what I was always told. Keep it private. They got up to leave, and I sat there. And I turned and I said, who do you guys think you are? And they turned around. They had big smiles on their faces. That bothered me too. Because I know these people. Oh yeah. And they came back and sat down. And I said, how can you guys talk about Jesus personally like that? You're... I know what you people are like. You talk like that on Sunday and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you just you go out and you make a fool of yourself. I know what you guys are like. I'm a good kid. As far as goodness goes on a scale, I'm here. You're here. I'm gooder than you guys. At least I'm honest with God. I Tell him, like, I tell him that, you know, I talk to him, I, I'm honest with him. Yeah, I might cuss and swear, but I tell him that too. I don't want to be a hypocrite like you guys. Man, did I... I normally am not like that, folks. Don't, don't get afraid of me because I'm normally not like that, but I had to let loose on these people. The leader, when I started talking about goodness... The leader said, uh, Daryl, there's a verse in Isaiah 64, 6. Have you ever read that? It says that our righteousness is as a filthy rag. Now, I hadn't read the Old Testament. I hadn't heard that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament and the law and everything else. And that Brian's been telling us about Christ fulfilling the Old Testament. The, the law, the words of the prof, prophets and the writers of the prof, prophets. And in one second, I'm not kidding, in one second, that verse hit me really hard. I hadn't heard that before. My righteousness is his filthy rag. And it is through Christ's righteousness and what he did on the cross that puts us in light with God in the proper way. Through Christ, through the bloodshed on the cross, he accredited us his righteousness. He took my sin on himself. He gave me his righteousness so that God could see me as a righteous person. Only through Christ and what he did on the cross. And he, the leader explained that a little bit as well. And then he said, and this took about two minutes at the most, and he said, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now? And I said, yes. I don't even remember saying yes. I fell on my knees on the floor because of that verse right there. I fell on my knees on the floor and I prayed a prayer that he prayed. I followed it. But as I was praying to accept Jesus into my heart and to accept what he did on the cross and to ask forgiveness and become a new person in Christ. As I was praying that, I saw myself as a big old house full of dirty water. That's what I saw in my mind's eye. And when I asked Jesus to come in, that house blew up. I saw the boards, I saw everything just flying. The windows went out and that dirty water just washed away. And that's what happened to me. That's how I was saved that day in 1969. And I got up from there and I was changed. I walked outside. I remember the birds. I could almost hear every bird singing. I smelt the grass, it seemed, for the first time. The tree, I've never seen it so green. The message that morning was just for me. First time I ever really opened my eye ears to the, to the word of God and it was for me it was a huge change 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. No more do I, did I walk around saying, well, I hope I go to heaven. I hope, I, I hope, I... No, no, no. It's a living hope. Not a dead hope. It's a living hope. In Christ, because of his resurrection. I became a, a Christian, of course, Read the Bible, go to church, pray, share occasionally, and uh, join a Bible study. You know, all the things that us Christians do, you know, I started doing those things, and it was pretty good. Generally speaking, I was going to trust the Lord. And uh, so, kind of a quiet, peaceful, Christian, fun kind of existence, and uh, never really evangelized anybody or anything like that, but just wanted to live with good character, good behavior, be a good person, and continue to pray and trust the Lord for my work and for my life and my family and so on. But becoming a little more serious and a little more earnest took place about three weeks ago, really, and I've had spurts and starts on this, but about three or four weeks ago, being a prospector is a little bit different. Digging earnestly into Christ, into his word. And um, what is a prospector? We know that it's a person who searches for gold, oil, or other valuable substances on the earth or under the earth. We read a little bit about what happened in Job 28. Dig, dig, dig. Man can do a lot of things. You know, really get in there and find gold. Wouldn't that be wonderful to find some gold? Here's a real prospector. Matter of fact, August 16th, today, 124 years ago, George here, George Carmack, an American, but he came up to the Yukon. He married a Canadian Native American lady, and uh, he went into the Yukon looking for gold. Well, he got fish first because he wanted to get ready for winter. Get some fish. So he got some fish. He didn't have enough, so he got some timber. And the last thing really on his list was he wanted to get his family ready for uh, winter. The last thing on his list really was to tromp through the trees and find streams and bedrock and find some gold. That's, there were prospectors up there, and he thought, well, I, I'm going to try that too, see if I can find some gold. He ended up being... Uh, the gold he found and where he found it, that was the beginning of the Klondike gold rush. George, a real prospector. And when they found gold, let me just read a little excerpt from a book about George, George Carmack, finding gold. Here's a little excerpt from a book written about him. Elation surged through him, overwhelming him. He threw the pan to the ground and leaped high into the air. Then he began dancing around the pan, a dance remotely related to a Scottish hornpipe, an Irish jig, and an Indian version of the hula hula. Jim and Charlie, his other two companions, his, his brother-in-law and another friend, Jim and Charlie joined him doing their own interpretation of a Tagish ceremonial dance. They were excited. They were dancing. They found gold. Quite a bit of it, too. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Gold? Gold? How many have got a stash of gold at home? Hey, It's beautiful. Gold. Very valuable. Very rare. Its color and luster, its weight, one cubic foot of gold weighs half a ton. It's amazing. Its resistance to oxidation and tarnishing is phenomenal. It retains its luster. Kings and queens, the Bible talks a lot about gold and silver. That was the wealth. That was the money. That was kings and queens jewelry. Anybody would love to have a piece of gold hanging from your ear or somewhere, you know? Gold watch. We, we really like gold. Highly malleable. And the ductility of gold is phenomenal. You can stretch it out, an ounce of gold, you can stretch it out over 60 feet and make a wire of it 60 feet long. There's another one I read about. Gold can be hammered into a sheet that is 100 square feet. 
a sheet, a thin sheet of gold can spread over a hundred square feet. Now, I'm not sure about that. That might be stretching it. <laughs> you know, oh, I know you like that one. How valuable is gold? Pretty valuable. Per gram, and this is Canadian money, not American. This is Canadian money. $85.20. An ounce? $2,600. A little over. Per pound, if you have a pound of butter, but let's say you had a pound of gold, $42,399.20. Pretty phenomenal. A kilo, $85,000. Can you imagine a kilo? 2.2 .2 pounds, that's all. 85000 A dime, this dime weighs 1.75 grams. If you just take a dime, and that's the Canadian dime, not the American. The American weighs two point something grams. So what, eh? Ours weighs 1.75 grams. Just give that a little, you know, a little flip there. You know, whoop. Well, there goes 150 bucks right there. 1.75 grams. $149.10. Here's the largest nugget ever found. John Deason over there and his friend Richard Oates in 1869, they found this in Australia. Now it says 210 pounds at the bottom. You see that rock right there? See that rock right there? That's the gold they found. Now there's some quartz involved as well. But once they got the quartz out of there and got that gold nugget two inches under the ground, they found it. It weighed 195.3 pounds. Today's value in Canadian dollars, $8,281,293.75. He got somewhere, whatever you read, depending on what you read, he got anywhere between $9,000 and $12,000 for that back in 1869. And it's called The Welcome Stranger. The Welcome Stranger. He brought it home to his wife, but he hid it kind of behind the corral. He walks in and he says to his wife, Honey, I've got something for you. And she said, Oh, no. He always had a tendency to invite people over for lunch that she didn't know about. And she said, Not another unwelcome stranger. No, honey. This is a welcome stranger. And that's how it got its name. Well, you can go dig today. If you want to get a pan and a shovel and a, you know, a, a deep seeker metal detector, you can go hunting for gold today. How many have watched the Aussie Gold Hunter series on TV? Oh, pretty exciting. You get a little bit, you know, you get an ounce or so, or not even an ounce. You get, well, that's 0.39 grams. Hey, over there, that must be something bigger. Let's try over there. Let's get better equipment. Instead of a $200 metal detector, let's get a $6,000 metal detector. Let's get totally geared up and equipped. There's more gold here. I know there is. There's got to be. Look at this. Let's get something that looks like that. You can't stop. It's like fishing. You get the gold fever. That's what gold fever is all about. You can't stop looking for gold. You know, get a fish this long, you want one this long. You want one this big, you want one this big. That's why we go musky fishing, some of us. That's why we go up north, because the pickerel here are this long. The ones up north are, you know, this long. And of course, you can only take certain kinds of different slot weights and lengths and so on. But you can't stop. You get hooked. It's amazing. Job 28, 1 through 11 says, we know how to find gold. We know where to mine. We know where to dig. We know what to dig for. We know why we're digging. We know how to shine light in the darkness. Isn't that an interesting, that's NLT version. We know how to shine light in the darkness. There could be a whole message just on, just on that. Man's wisdom, God's wisdom. Could be a whole, I'm not going there today. I don't have time. We know how to sink a mine shaft. We know how to tear apart flinty rocks. We know how to overturn the roots of mountains. We know how to tear mountains apart with equipment and this and that and everything else. We know how to cut tunnels and uncover precious stones. We know how to dam up the trickling streams and bring to light the hidden treasures. On a spiritual level, on a spiritual level, 
Do we know how to dam up the trickling streams? To bring light the hidden treasures of God? And that's where we go to verse 12 in chapter 28. But man knows how to do, how to find gold. He knows how to do a lot of things. But do we know where to find wisdom? Do we know where to find understanding? Do you know why? Because they are more precious than gold. You think an ounce of gold is worth a lot? And it is in monetary value for us today. But we're missing the boat here, folks. I was missing the boat. These things are more precious than gold. What else is more precious than gold? I got thinking about that next. I had more questions than answers when I waded into this. The blood of Christ. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold and silver from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished. Unblemished and spotless. You think refined, pure gold has a lot of value compared to this? None. First Peter 1.18 Faith. Our faith is more precious than gold. I should say our genuine faith is more precious than gold. And the Lord will, as he's done in my life and others, I'm sure yours as well, he will test your faith. And there will be trials. He says we're going to have trials for a little while. These trials will show your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire and purifies gold. Though your faith is more precious than mere gold. And we've read that, and I've read that before. But on Recently, you read the scripture. Isn't it interesting how you read it one day, it's just words. The next day, the same scripture gets to you. It gets to your heart. It digs deep and it, and it convicts you. What else? A good name. A good name is to be chosen rather than riches, great riches. And favor is better than silver and gold. Your character, I don't care what political party you belong to, I don't care what you say. I don't care what, uh, what you wear. I don't care what you look like. What we should care about is our character. What is the character like? What are the actions? Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver and gold. These are the things that are better than silver and gold. A good name. Speak the truth. Oh, you know, a little white, a little stretch this, stretch that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, no, no. Be honest. Lord is talking to me. <laughs> Be honest with yourself, Daryl. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. That was a little bit of a, no, or do you want to go there? You said something, and do you want to pursue that? No, 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 no. Be truthful. Truth is is another wonderful nugget that should be pursued. There's a whole bunch of things. I've just named a few. Our soul, more precious than gold, or anything, any wealth of the world. Are you going to forfeit, Daryl? Daryl, are you going to forfeit your soul for the things of the world? Is that You want to go there? You want to do that? You can. I gave you a choice. You can choose. That's fine. I gave you the gift of choosing. What are you going to choose? It's up to you. Heaven. Laying up treasures in heaven because that says there, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Laying up treasures in heaven. I don't know. What might that be? That's a whole study onto its own. Praying in secret. Not flaunting your rel religiosity around. No, no. Pray in secret. Are you going to, are you going to uh, retaliate with a blessing? Or are you going to retaliate in kind to what that person did to you last week? Those are, those are, I would think, they may be treasures that you're laying up in heaven. All right? Accepting insults and persecutions because you love the Lord. Having that kind of a, you know, laying those kind of things up. 
the Word of God, instructions, Psalm 1 through 2, that also talks about meditating on the Word of God day and night. But the instructions, the decrees, the commands, the reverence for the Lord is pure, lasts forever. Psalm 19, 7 through 10. So I've had to ask myself some questions. All these wonderful things that are much more valuable than gold. Where am I staking my claim? Where did I stake my claim? Well, I staked my claim in Christ. 1969. Most recently, I've had to take a hammer and pound that stake in three or four more inches. I've had to make another commitment to do that. So where have we staked our claim and does it need to be pounded in to the ground a little bit deeper? Do we need to dig a little bit deeper? I'm encouraging all of us this morning to dig deeper. Have I moved my staked claim to another location hoping for something better? Oh, got to watch out for that because the Lord hasn't really, well, let's say the Lord hasn't talked to you recently. You haven't heard from him. Um, He's not, he didn't answer that prayer the way I expected. Matter of fact, I haven't, I don't know if he's even answering it. I don't know where he is. I'm going to take my stake and I'm going to, there's something glittering over there behind the tree. I'm going to take my stake over there and I'm going to try that. That's what I'm going to do. So we move our stake. Does hay and straw seem more appealing to you, Daryl? That was what, the Lord convicted me of. Do you want to go roll in the hay and the straw and, and forget about some of the things that aren't going to burn up? Hay and straw is going to burn up. Things of God are not. They're eternal. So where do you find wisdom and understanding? Job 28, 28. It says the fear of God is understanding. Avoiding Evil is, understand, is understanding. Fear of God is wisdom, I'm sorry. Fear of God is wisdom. Avoiding evil is understanding. What does fearing the Lord mean? I don't know, maybe it's a reverence for the Lord. We don't want to displease the Lord. Um, kind of like King David in Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast not me away from your presence. There was kind of a, a fear that he would be cast away from his presence. That's a healthy fear that we need to have. God, we want to, I want to retain the relationship with you. I don't want to lose that. Renew a right spirit within me. A willing spirit within me. And restore the joy of your salvation. So King David was pretty fearful in a sense, wanting to please the Lord, wanting more of the Lord in his life. If those who dig for gold need a metal detector, what do we need? And this, these are the questions that I went through the last few weeks. In my naturalism, in my humanism, in my flesh and body thinking, my mind, have I seriously considered and come to terms with the supernaturality of God? I think oftentimes we go to a particular line and then anything else that's really supernatural after that, we don't want to we, we don't want to go over that line. All right? And it's because we're so human, aren't we? And if you really want to sink into the supernaturality of God, we're not sure what that territory looks like. It'd be wonderful, I think, if we could. And that leads me to this. The Holy Spirit will reveal. He's our metal detector. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, and Jesus is saying this, whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. But it is written, 
what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. He searches everything. He searches you. He, he reveals the inspired word of God to us. He will reveal things to us that we need to know about God. And he will reveal a lot of what those valuable things are that I mentioned and I listed. He will reveal them to you in a marvelous way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on to your own understanding. But acknowledge him in all your ways. And at the end of that it says, Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Again, find some wisdom and understanding that God is willing to give you. Uh, this is the, and I'll wrap it up here pretty soon. The, uh, this is the verse that started the whole thing in my life about this. What is really valuable? What is really valuable, Daryl? And then pursue it. Dig for it. Dig deep. This is the verse in Luke 6, 46 through 47. The verses that really started this whole thing going. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? That first line got to me. You, you do this, Daryl, you do this and that and everything else, but you still do not do the things I tell you to do. Be a little more attentive, please. Um, I'm, I've got things to tell you. Just do them. In faith. Everyone who comes to me, come to me, Daryl, hear my words, and the closer you are to him, the better you're able to hear him and do them. I will show you what, what it's really like to be a man building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on the rock. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of that foundation. Dig deep. Now this is in relation to building a foundation. I'm talking about digging deep uh, as one of the living stones in that foundation. I need to dig and find out what's really valuable so that I can contribute to the foundation and make it really, really strong. So we can build on my life in a spiritual way. So when the floods come, when COVID comes, when any other flood comes or any other storms or trials, the house has been well built. Now we need one another for this as well. We need to encourage, we need to pray for one another, we need to have fellowship. That's all part of it as well. That is valuable. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So stake a claim. Stake your claim. Hammer it deeper. Seek search. Dig deep. Let the Holy Spirit go to work revealing things in his word. Dig into Christ. Dig into the word. Into things of heaven. Into the things of your soul. Not being afraid of man. What can man do, you, you know, with God is for you? Who can be against you? Dig into things of the soul. Into fearing the Lord, finding wisdom, into faith, into doing good. And there are many nuggets. Fruits of the Spirit are nuggets of the Lord. Gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit include wisdom and knowledge. So let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Be a prospector. Wait a minute. Am I the prospector? Uh, let's think about that for a minute. Yes, I'm a digger. I want to dig deep. Oh, there's the prospector as well. That's God. He staked a claim on my life before the foundation of the world. Did you know that? Ephesians 1, 3. He predestined me. He chose me. He chose you. He chose everyone. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He chose everyone to be a part of his kingdom through the blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. He staked a claim on your life a long time ago. He's the prospector. Oh, is that the prospector I've been talking about and studying about? Yeah. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all his innermost parts. Oh, he searches too. Wow, that's, 
The Lord searches the heart and tests the mind. Ooh, my thoughts? Really? He checks, Daryl, do you really want to think that way? Okay. So we're actually partners because I dig. He digs into me. I dig into him. I draw close to him. He draws closest to me. I dig into him. He digs into me. Oh, I see. That's a partnership. Cool. We're friends. We're family. He's my father. I'm the son. I'm adopted into the kingdom of God. You are adopted into the kingdom of God. It's family. Oh, so this whole thing really is a loving relationship that I delight in. Awesome. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Who with? Together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up He's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. Notice the word with. How many times is it with? I live my life for Christ not for what he's going to do for me. I live my life with Christ because I want to be with him. It's a relationship. I want him to dig into my life. I want to dig into his life. We're diggers together. Because I want to be with him. I want to be with him. I have a friend who said, there's two things that he knows. Number one, God is worthy of all praise and all worship. And number two, I want to hear from him. Those two things I know. So, I'm a work in progress. We all are. And am I just scratching the surface? That's our challenge. Are you just going to continue to scratch the surface? Or are you going to get out the pickaxe? Are you going to get out the shovel? The Holy Spirit will reveal to you those valuable riches that are in store for each and every one of us. So thank you very much for me being able to share that with you this morning and I'll just have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are the lifter of our head again and we thank you that there are treasures and riches that we're not even aware of. Lord, we're just scratching, I'm just scratching the surface. Help us to dig deeper, Lord Jesus. Give us, encourage us to dig deeper. And these riches, Lord Jesus, of you, we give away. We don't hoard them like gold. These are the riches to be given away once we find them. Help us to give them away in this community to one another. And we praise you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.